Admiral, if in fact uh, there was a bomb on board this aircraft, and if in fact it was ISIS or an ISIS-affiliated uh, group, how much of a, of a game changer is this? Well, one, I, I think it remains to be determined whether or not it was ISIS. But, uh, but if it was, I'm not sure it's much of a game changer. The fact of the matter is uh, we need to have a strategy to go against ISIS, irrespective of whether or not this was an ISIS attack or not. And I think the president, uh, as I have seen the reports, is beginning to develop a strategy. Uh, he's putting 50 special operations forces on the ground in Syria, and I think that's a good first step. Uh, but uh, clearly, uh, we need to take a look at a broader approach to, uh, to going after ISIS. If, in fact, this was an ISIS bomb, then I think it just adds to the sense of, uh, of who they are. I mean, they are barbarians in every sense of the word. They have no respect for life. There is nothing about their ideology that does anyone any good. It is not going to make the lives of the people in Syria or Iraq or anywhere else better. So we need to figure out how we're going to defeat this threat. And this is just one more indication of, uh, of how violent and how barbaric they can be. In, in terms of their methods, do you see a, a great difference between them and Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda Central? Uh, I don't see a lot of difference. I mean, if you look at uh, who Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi was, I mean, he came from Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Uh, we know that a lot of the fighters that, that are part of ISIS were part of the Al-Qaeda in Iraq uh, group. So you're going to see a lot of the same tactics, techniques, and procedures. I would just tell you that I think ISIS has raised it to an entirely different level in terms of the, the local Al-Qaeda aff affiliates, if you will, that we've been fighting. Uh, when you go back to 9-11, obviously that was a horrendous attack. Um, but they are employing a lot of those same tactics, that being the beheadings, the terror, uh, the systematic raping that we saw in other parts of, uh, of the Middle East in terms of what they're doing in Syria and Iraq today. But, but in terms of really battling ISIS and really trying to defeat them and obviously other groups, you think it's going to take more than just uh, an increase in, in special operations forces uh, in, in the short term. I mean, you've talked about a, a generational conflict here. Yeah, I do believe it's a generational conflict. And I think the hard part is for the American people to recognize we're in a war. We're in a serious war. And we may not like it. Uh, we may not uh, hope that we have to fight it. But the fact of the matter is wishing it away will not make it any easier. And so we've got to come up with a strategy uh, to aggressively go after ISIS. And again, I applaud the president uh, for these steps that he's taking now. Uh, but if we don't get more aggressive, uh, then I think we're going to have to continue to fight these guys, not only in Syria and in Iraq, but, uh, but other places, as clearly they're, they're showing in their attack, potential attack on this uh, Russian airliner. I, I'm not going to ask you of sort of what troop level you think there should be on the ground in Afghanistan or in Iraq. I know you're not privy to the latest intelligence. And, and, right. but, but in terms of, um, of the commitment, um, I mean, there are, there are a lot of people who, you know, certainly want to just move away from, from Iraq, move away from Afghanistan, get all U.S. forces out. What can, you know, 10,000 or however many U.S. forces on the ground in Iraq do that we couldn't do years ago with the Iraqi forces? Well, I think we did do it years ago with Iraqi forces, Anderson. If you take a look at where we were uh, when we left Iraq, the Iraqi army was in a pretty good place. Now, admittedly, uh, you know, I would like to have seen us stay there longer, but I understand the, the president's decision to move us out. But the Iraqi army was in a pretty good position when we left. They were reasonably well trained. Uh, they were certainly not as integrated as we would like to have seen. And I think we saw the result of that lack of integration when uh, ISIS crossed the border and began to engage them. But the fact of the matter is uh, the steps that we're taking now in Iraq, the approximately 3,500 folks that we have on the ground, this is a great first step, but I think what we've got to be able to do is look at this in a broader context. We have to understand that this fight against ISIS is, is not something we can do on the margins. I heard uh, the Chief of Staff of the Army, Mark Milley, the other day say that the American people have got to commit. So this is not just about the American military, and this is frankly not just about the President. The American people have to understand what this threat is, and they've got to commit to the fight. Uh, I think it would be great to have the national leadership really articulate why we need to do this. But I do think this is a generational fight, and I think it's going to require, unfortunately, the lives of more young men and women and, and billions more dollars in order for us to be able to destroy this threat. But if we don't do it now, we are going to have to do it later. And, and so you, it's just a, just a matter of timing. And you don't see it as, uh, you know, just training uh, the, the Iraqi forces and then being able to leave. I mean, what you're really advocating for and, and saying is a necessity is not only in Iraq but also Afghanistan is a long-term presence 
enmeshed with local forces because uh, it's not you're saying it's not enough to just right. train them once and then pull out because that's what we did in the past yeah i think we do have to be partnered with them on the ground we certainly need to train them but frankly we need to not only train them we need to be on the front lines with them uh, where required and frankly we need to be prepared to lead if they're not and this is the hard issue that people grapple with is they want to say that this is an arab problem or this is a problem in the middle east and why should we the united states take the lead on this I'm not sure there's a good answer other than to say, if we don't take the lead, we're going to continue to see ISIS and other factions move throughout the, uh, the region. And the problem with ISIS isn't only the threat that they're creating in Syria and Iraq. It is, frankly, the second and, or, the second and third order effects they have on Lebanon, on Jordan, some of our very best allies. Right, all of which are vulnerable. Pressure can, which are very vulnerable. And if that pressure continues to build, the potential for the region to become more inflamed, I think, uh, grows every day. It, I mean, this is probably a stupid question, a stupid way of looking at it, but why does it seem that the, the forces that the United States supports in Iraq and in Afghanistan need billions of dollars and constant training, whereas the forces we're arrayed against seem to not? I mean, they, they have foreign fighters. They don't necessarily have extensive training. They seem quite capable in ways that these well-trained forces uh, or once well-trained forces aren't. Yeah, because they have no rules, uh, because one, they have very little structure. So you are fighting this kind of amorphous group in ISIS. I mean, they have, obviously, they have leadership and they have some structure. But when you're kind of an unconventional force like ISIS is, it's much harder to defeat. Uh, they, they live amongst the people day in and day out. So the issues of drone strikes and going after the leadership, it's hard to find the leadership when during the day they look like the average uh, potentially innocent Syrians that are out there. So it's just a much, much tougher fight uh, to go against an unconventional enemy that really has no rules, no rules of engagement. They don't respond to the law of armed conflict. They don't respond to international conventions. So it, it in some ways, kind of ties our hand and make, ties our hands and make it, makes it harder to go after. I mean, is it your belief that even if ISIS is defeated, that some other group will, will pop up? I mean, to the point of this is a generational conflict, is this also a war of ideas that has to be battled as such? Well, well, certainly uh, there is an I ideological aspect of this. But I will tell you that the, the ideology that ISIS uh, puts forth is not an ideology I think that anybody that really puts any thought into it wants to have. Uh, it doesn't do the people of Syria any good. It doesn't do the people of Iraq any good. It is a perverted ideology, and it is not uh, an ideology, in my opinion, that's consistent with the Islamic ideology, which is a, I mean, I have a lot of friends uh, across the Middle East that are fabulous. Uh, but but this is a perverted ideology. Do we have to fight it? We do, but frankly, we have to go after the leadership and we have to go after the fighters at the same time. You know, just as there are people on the left who have said, look, get out of Iraq, get out of, of, of Afghanistan no matter what, there's others uh, who, who are running for president. I mean, Donald Trump, for instance, is saying, bomb the hell out of, of you know, ISIS, surround the oil fields with U.S. forces in Iraq and take the oil. Does that make any sense to you from a, from a strategic standpoint? Well, you know, once again, uh, the, the great thing about uh, the folks we have today, when you look at uh, Dr. Ash Carter and you look at uh, General uh, Joe Dunford, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, General Lloyd Austin, who is the CENTCOM commander, these are magnificent public servants. We have two of the fi finest generals in the Marine Corps and the Army that are really kind of, that are shaping and fighting this fight in, in Lloyd Austin and Joe Dunford. Uh, so I'm sure that they are working hard to come up with a strategy that will support the president's plan, uh, that will be the right kind of strategy, a broad strategy that brings in the coalition, that brings in our allies, and that uh, works towards defeating ISIS. Uh, so you, you can't just look at the oil fields in Iraq, and you can't just look at, at Raqqa in Syria. You really do have to look at this in a, in a strategic framework. But again, the people of the United States of America have to commit to this fight. And therefore, we have to make sure they understand uh, the nature of this fight. And, and I would tell you that I think that this is a generational fight. Uh, it's one we wish we didn't have to fight, but I think, again, wishing it away will not make it uh, any less important and any less uh, important to deal with. You've had an incredible career. I mean, 37 years of, of service. You retired at the end of last year. You've moved into academia. I'm just wondering why the shift into academia, and, and are there parallels in terms of what you did to what you're doing now? Well, you know, when I left the military, the best thing about being in the military was the opportunity to shape the lives of young men and women, the soldiers, sailors, airmen, marine, and, 
and the Coast Guardmen and, and the DOD civilians that I worked with. And so the, the only opportunity I had coming out of uh, 37 years in the Navy was really to come into this job as the Chancellor of the University of Texas and hopefully continue to be able to shape the lives of the young men and women in Texas. And that was the parallel. That was really what brought me to this job. And, and in terms of, of being a Chancellor, I mean, what do, you, what do you hope to accomplish over the next, you know, the however many years? Well, I, I had an opportunity to kind of roll out my strategy today uh, to the Board of Regents of the University of Texas system. And we, we looked at a number of quantum leaps, quantum leaps in our ability to really take the UT system to the next level. A lot of it had to do with leadership and diversity and fairness, making sure that we are investing in our faculty, that, that we are investing in our students, but also making sure, frankly, from what I learned in my time in the military, that we have an agile and, and, and a flexible enough system administration, system administration, to be able to react to whatever problems are out there so that we don't have this bureaucracy that doesn't move quickly enough to be able to respond to problems. So part of what I learned in the military was how great organizations flatten themselves in order to be able to deal with complex problems. The best part of the military, of course, was being able to shape the lives of young men and women. So I come to the University of Texas system here, and, and I have the opportunity to do both. Well, Admiral, I appreciate you uh, taking the time to talk to us. Thank you. My pleasure, Anderson. Thank you.